Okay, so we are, I've hit record and just want to let everybody know that. And so um, this will be available to folks on the internet. We have a tiny YouTube channel for the Taos Abstract Artist Collective, where we are archiving um, cool content and films and things like that, that we've been working on. Um, so you can definitely check that link is on our, um, through our website and our Instagram. But again, welcome to everybody today. I'm joined here by um, Aaliyah Horline, Aaliyah, if you could wave, and Carrie Bell, um, co-founders of the Taos Abstract Artist Collective. And um, Paul Banky recently joined our team as a core collaborator um, and is um, regretfully not here with us now, but we'll watch later. Um, so without further ado, I um, want to really welcome and say thank you so much to Danila Rumald for participating in our TAC Talk today. Danila, could you wave, say hello, and I'll pin you when we get to the Q&A portion. Um, thank you so much. Hi, thank you, Lauren. And thank you, everybody, for being here this afternoon or evening, depending on where you're at. I know it's um, many people might be traveling, but hopefully this will be a nice hour for us to connect around art and life. So thanks again for being here. And just really briefly want to say thank you to Lauren, Carrie, and Aaliyah, and Paul for just all the incredible work you've put into creating this community and um, the exhibition and catalogs and the art talks and just the promotions. It's really an exciting new um, component to our artistic community here in the New Mexico and the Southwest. So thank you. Thanks, Danila. We're so delighted and we're excited to get to know everybody. I also wanna give a special shout out to Mark Smith, who's helping to produce this series and really the format and structure and content was largely his concept. And so thank you, Mark, um, being our, uh, Mark is also my partner and a uh, talented videographer. So we're, we're grateful for Mark's assistance on this, these projects for sure. Um, I just wanna say a couple words about what the Abstract Artist Collective is, if you're tuning in um, and aren't familiar with us, we'll just briefly orient everybody. We're a relatively newly formed group, um, formed or the concept started back in 2020, but we really launched into action this past year with our first inaugural show at the Stables Gallery here in Taos, New Mexico. Um, we have an online presence and we are doing a lot of in-person, um, our hope is to do a lot of in-person gatherings. We'll have exhibitions ongoing online and in-person. Um, and we have lots of things that we will be announcing soon. So we're not going to announce it now, um, but please stay tuned. Um, check us on social media and sign up for our newsletter. And you can always email us. But um, we are a group that promotes abstract artists working in or near Taos, New Mexico, and really northern New Mexico towards the exchange of ideas, new aesthetics, and creative concepts. Taos is synonymous with abstract thinking with its origins in indigenous geometries, transcendental and modernist movements, conceptual and land art installation. Once the nexus for westward bound artists, Taos unleashes expansive abstract thinkers. And so it's really in this um, with this ethos in mind that we continue onward and we continue to collaborate with all of you and look forward to lots of future exciting um, events. So this is one of them. This series is um, also new and we are a little bit different. For those of you that have attended other artist talks in the past, this one's a little bit different um, in the sense that we will be screening a pre-recorded interview that Mark and I and Carrie went and visited with Danila in Danila's studio in Albuquerque and had a lovely conversation. And it gives us an opportunity, since we're all so accustomed to the Zoom universe these days, it gives us a real strong opportunity to get a close look into an artist's life and practice and studio in a way that isn't truly afforded if we were sitting here um, and just having a conversation. Um, so it's a little bit of a part A and B. So part A is the screening of the video, which is 30 minutes. And then part B is a Q&A with Danila. So I'm gonna invite everybody to really think about questions that might pop up for you or things you're struck by as you're tuning into the video. And then when we come back together, we'll have a chance for a really lovely conversation. We can ask um, additional questions that might have emerged from watching. Um, and Danila, questions might come up for you too. So we look forward to that part of it as well. So 
I think without any further ado, we're going to get started. And if folks would just give me a moment to coordinate the tech here, um, I'm going to stop my video and share my screen. Um, if anything goes horribly wrong, somebody will for sure tell me, but I'm hoping that nothing will with the tech. So bear with me one moment here. Hi, Danila. Thanks so much for having us here in your studio today. We'd love to start by just hearing a little bit more about having a ritual or a, a way of coming into this space. And I have to say, we were commenting, feels incredibly peaceful in your studio. It feels tranquil. It feels um, there's a quality that's a little bit hard to describe, but I'm going to ask you to describe it, I guess. Yeah. Could you talk with us a little bit more about how does it feel to come into your space? What do you need to do to prepare your space or prepare yourself even for your practice. Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Yeah. I also um, intentionally created a space of ease and peacefulness because um, with two young children at home, that's something I really didn't don't get a lot of and really missed. Um, during my lifetime, actually in Seattle, I started practicing Buddhism um, and silent meditation. And so silence has become sort of almost a necessary part of my wellness and my life. Um, and so having this opportunity to have this outside of the home studio really was the sanctuary I wanted to create for myself. And so the studio is in between my home and dropping off the children. And then I come here to the studio and I'll come in and I'll light an, an incense stick. And then I sit down on my meditation cushion and I'll meditate for about 20 minutes. Um, and then I get up after that and I usually have something waiting for me on my work table, um, either a drawing or collage that I'm working on, or I'll often start a dye bath in my kitchen, boil some water, get something going to process the paper for my work. Well, I was really interested to hear more about silence, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, talk to me a little bit about what that means for you in your work. How does it come into play? Mm -hmm. Has it always been a theme that you've been playing with or that's been important to you in your relationships or in your relationship to your work? Well, it's interesting. I think unconsciously it always has played a role, especially as a child living at home. I felt like I had a studio in my basement um, and I would go down there and, and you know, paint or draw. And when it, whenever anybody came in to interrupt me, I'd be very startled. So sort of having that silence and the space to create um, has always been important for me. Um, and as I continue to make work over the last 20 years, oftentimes people will respond to my work with like, it's so peaceful, it's so quiet. And it's not that I'm intending to intentionally make the work in that way, but I think that the work gets created out of that environment that I'm like both physical and mental environments that I'm engaging with. It's kind of an interesting juxtaposition as I look at your work because visually, though it has that calming mm -hmm. quality to it, there's so much happening. Mm -hmm. There are so many layers. There's, I mean, visually, it's both quiet and not quiet. Mm -hmm. um, and I appreciate the process. That in itself is also so layered. And we'll get to talking more about it. Um, but I think you know, your combination of form and texture mm -hmm. and color and you know, all of those things together for me, when I think about them formally in terms of, comp you know, formal elements of art making, mm -hmm. quiet or silence is not the first thing that comes mm -hmm. to mind. So you're achieving something really, I think, mm -hmm. quite beautiful and special in, in the way that every, all of those elements come together. That's a really neat observation. I don't know that anyone's ever made that or I've heard that. And I think for me, the way I understand it is, you know, the formal elements you're talking about with the texture, the color, the layering and all that. Um, that's the life of the piece, right, mm -hmm. of its making. Sure. And I feel like, you know, you can't have silence without having both also chaos or noise. And so 
um, it's kind of playing both sides of the coin. Mm -hmm. I feel like if we're, everything is so minimal and so controlled and so much at ease that it's going to lose, it's going to lose an aliveness, Mm -hmm. which I want my work to have. Well, that's a really nice lead into one of the themes that we were talking about, which is sustainability. Yeah. How does something endure? How does it have permanence and impermanence at the same time? But sustainability is a word that I think about a lot in art practice, in life, in other ways. How do we achieve it? What does it mean? And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about your relationship to sustainability in your practice. Sure. Um, Yeah, so really it kind of started in the kitchen at my home. So before I had this studio, I had a home studio, but also my home domestic life where I basically for the first five years stayed home with them um, before they were at school. And so everything I did was really integrated both at home and um, with children and with my artwork. And so um, one of the first things that I changed in my practice moving to Albuquerque and making my work was, um, first of all, working from home, but also changing, moving away from oil paints, which was my primary medium for like 15 years. And so I really, I was asking myself, like, how do I create a safe environment to continue to make artwork with my children that's Mm non-toxic? So it really started out of the concern for toxicity of materials. Um, And I experimented with kitchen dyes, so things like beets, blueberries, um, onion skins, pomegranate, cabbage, Mm -hmm. like all the foods that I was using in my kitchen to make smoothies for the kids or meals and noticing their staining properties. And so that was really the beginning of the sort of the pivot in my practice um, and the shift towards sustainability. As I started to contemplate the dyes and the color, I started to think more about like the surfaces that I worked on because primarily I was always using canvas as a painter. So I switched to paper, um, which um, I really have gravitated towards a mulberry paper, which is a natural, um, it's called Kozo, it's a Japanese paper, and have been using it primarily, um, almost, not exclusively, but primarily for the last five, six years. And um, so I, I shifted to paper and working on paper and dyes and then started to experiment with like incorporating them. Um, in terms of sustainability, also just thinking about like efficiency of time and like integrating it into domestic parts of my world, like paper or sleeping on paper underneath my bed while I was either co-sleeping with my children or trying to get some sleep, putting um, it on my kitchen countertop to absorb the stains of paper, started to include domestic tools like um, the washing machine to wash paper. And so it it sort of started with this like need to make it safe, non-toxic, then into integrating it into my des- domestic life. But then also thinking about like, what are all the things that we use in a home and bring into it and the waste that we put out. So I started reusing like eggshells in my work, um, started reusing the form of cardboard boxes in my work. Um, so taking what was being thrown away essentially and bringing it into the artwork. I think it was sort of first off conceptually, it was more of like a search for non-duality of like not seeing domestic life as separate from my artistic life. Um, So that was sort of my own search for integration, um, not seeing those boundaries. Um, And yeah, I definitely at that time had my kids involved in my artwork too. So they would help me crush the shells, the eggshells. They helped me mix it in the binder that I used, um, pressing it down on the paper. So, you know, I I was able to incorporate the kids into my practice earlier on. So they were definitely aware of what I was doing and involved in the process. Great. How does it feel in terms of the finished piece? If your work is thinking about, if you're grappling with sustainability, Mm -hmm. is it important for you, for your pieces to have, you know, since you're working with paper and paper Mm -hmm. can degrade over time, is it important for you for the work itself to have durability or is it intended to over time shift or change? I think to answer that question, it's shifted over time. I think at the beginning, I wasn't concerned with its longevity. I wasn't thinking about Um, would this fade, would this last? Um, Although I did use like a a matte medium to seal all the works on the front and the back. And so they were like, in terms of durability, their strength, the paper is very strong itself. I really wasn't worried about that. Um, But I was more concerned about the color. 
fading. And that did come into play, whereas as I continued on the journey, I got really interested in botanical plants. So started looking at like the Navajo dye chart I have over here. Okay. Um, you know, living here in the Southwest, there's a whole tradition and history of using um, natural dyes from Pueblo people. And so I uh, started to research and read about it and then really dove into for beginning to forage plants myself, looking for them, identifying them, and bringing those dyes into my studio, which I found a lot of the plant ones do fade. And so ultimately, um, I ended up really um, focusing on the last couple years with like three main primary dyes, including the color. So indigo, matter root, and weld are like the three primary colors I use. And then I've been experimenting a lot with overlaying colors, how to create other colors through mixing, color mixing, but in dyes. Um, so, so yeah, it's kind of taking me down a journey of like not caring and caring, but also I really like this idea of chance and intention. And so like allowing, allowing things to kind of take their own course in materials, um, and then bringing my own artistic sensibility and, and intention to the work. Um, can you talk to me a little bit more about what your current, um, your current process or current series or current pieces that you're working on. I know that you yeah. just had a show. Yeah. Are you continuing on with that or are you working in a new yeah. context? Well, that show is really exciting. I had a show up in Chicago, the one you're referring to, Tiger Strikes Asteroid. And for the first time, it was I took actually three different so I, I like to work in series, and I had three series happening over the last three years, actually. They've been evolving concurrently, and sort of always that question, I think, not all artists, but I certainly myself have grappled with, like, you know, worrying that the work is going in different directions, and oh my gosh, what does that mean? And I'm not consistent or coherent. But I've really come to embrace that they all have threads in them, and so I... <clears throat> I don't see the works as so different anymore, but um, on the far wall in the back are some works in process that were included in the show, and they're more my sort of body abstractions, I'll call them, um, really leaning into starting at looking at references to ancient art, um, their surfaces, their colors, their forms, the simplicity of shape and things like that, exploring themes of love and death. Um, so those are sort of the focuses of those works. Um, and then I have over here, the larger works on this wall are um, from my Sacred Families um, series. And those, those started really at the beginning of the pandemic and have been evolving and they continue to evolve. And so I'm making more of those, but those really came out of um, drawing as well. Um, I always start with drawing as my foundation. And I really started with a very simple format, which is, I like to start with one structure and then see what variabilities I can get out of it. So it starts with the catenary curve, which is just basically a U shape, a point from A to B um, connected in U. So if you think about like a, um, a laundry line or telephone wires. And so starting with that shape and then trying to find um, as many different possible shapes from within that. And then these works also explore paper collage and um, natural dyes and mineral pigments. Uh, and then I have, sorry, the last, the third series are the scroll, the long scrolls, and then over on the wall behind you, the smaller fragments of scrolls that I'm making um, at the same time. It, that sounds like it's a nice lead into the, um, again, integration, right? The integration mm -hmm. of maybe spiritual life and artistic practice. Yeah. And I wonder if you'd like to share a little bit more about You'd mentioned Buddhism, you'd mentioned that connection to identity. Mm -hmm. You're thinking about motherhood, mm -hmm. artist identity. There are a lot of different intersecting identities. So I'm gonna, yeah. you know, what feels most comfortable to speak about next, do you think? Yeah, well, I think that's a good segue. It sort of um, integrates into all the topics we've already talked about. Um, but spe yeah, specifically in terms of, um, I haven't really ever really ever open, openly spoken about spirituality in my work, um, but it's always been there and it's been prominent through my Buddhist practice over 20 years, I mentioned. So that involves a lot of study of it, reading of Eastern philosophy, as well as silent meditation. And then um, also bringing that practice to daily life, like how do we bring ourselves to our experiences and how do we respond to them? So um, again, kind of seeking that the non-dualism non in the work. Um, 
And um, recently I've had a more large life experience presented to me in June. I was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, um, which has been devastating. Um, but it's been an incredible tool to have this practice like supporting me and, and guiding me through it to really stay in the present. Um, so the work really is, um, is situated in the now. It seems in some ways that the, as you're describing, your artist practice and your studio practice was a container available to you when you received that news mm -hmm. that what a, you know, um, I don't know, the word that's coming up for me is sort of comfort to have something to lean into. And I don't know if it instantly feels comforting or if it feels just bewildering at first, but then to have, you speak of ritual, to have something that, and repetition. Yeah. And that in itself can feel incredibly soothing and grounding mm -hmm. and rooting mm -hmm. to self. And, and in that way, you had this foundation sort of waiting to maybe provide a buffer. These are my words, not yeah. yours, so feel, feel, feel free well, to jump in. I mean, it really is like where the rubber hits the road, right? Taking your practice into your own life and how, how are we going to, you know, move from day to day. And of course there's ups and downs, but certainly, um, yeah, the word you use repetition came to mind because there's a re repetition to a uh, practice, which is a daily practice, which I've had in my studio, but which also happens in meditation to, you know, commit yourself to sit on the cushion every day, um, uh, to read something, you know, that is inspiring, that does give a lot of solace. And so, um, and there's a, there's something about that repetition, like the action of making, like in my studio, it's tearing paper, you know, gluing it next. So like I, I make these parts into a larger whole. Mm -hmm. So repetition becomes part of all of those kind of areas in my life that come together. I think spirituality and art is, I was talking about this re, uh, yeah. with somebody else recently as it having been informal art history and maybe art training, a little bit of a taboo topic, yeah. right? It's like, we can't say the word psycho-spiritual or we can't really talk about spirituality um, or couldn't before, but I will say I feel like it's shifting. I wonder if you feel that way as you're presenting your body of work to galleries, to the community, mm -hmm. just what you choose to share. Yeah. Um, yeah, just was very recently thinking about what a shift that's been. Maybe yeah. that's because we're here in the Southwest and that's prominent mm -hmm. and you spoke about um, you spoke about culture, heritage, visiting your aunt in Uruguay, yeah. using ancestral indigenous mm -hmm. materials of this place. Mm -hmm. So really being very specific about that. Mm -hmm. But what do you think about psycho-spirituality and sort of, you know, the bigger art world or, or the abstract art world? How has that landed for you or when you share it with others? Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, it's becoming more and more open. Even 10, 15 years ago, I, I had my own blog, when people wrote blogs still, <laughs> um, I had a blog on spirituality <laughs> and art. And I was really like seeking out contemporary artists who were interested in that. and. I, I, I did find people, but it, was, it wasn't it was sort of your everyday topic. And coming out of an academic background, having been trained and then working later as a professor of art, I found in academia there wasn't a whole lot of space for talking about it, um, which has been one of the beauties of moving to the Southwest where it's kind of like I left behind my academic life. Um, I left behind the big cities where I had been showing my artwork and I found a great freedom here in the spaciousness of this beautiful land and the people here, um, both native and non-native, who are living here. Um, and and also, frankly, like early motherhood, all of those things felt, in a way, like they felt isolating at the beginning, but they also ended up providing so much freedom for choice mm -hmm. of like what I wanted to make and how I wanted to talk about it. And I really have found that freedom here. And really letting go of the painter's identity. I can't believe how locked in I was. Like, I just, painting was everything to me. And if it wasn't made out of paint, I barely wanted to look at it. <laughs> and now it's just like, oh, paper. I just, I've tried to go back to canvas and paint. And I just, I, I don't know, the facility, something has lost, it's lost. 
I feel like I'm just, I've had that experience and now it's really about paper and dyes and the touch of that, how they come together. Um, was it a gradual process or was it? I mean, I think as soon as I started experimenting in the kitchen, I didn't turn back. Okay. And yeah, I love, I love that it brings that uncertain result. You know, the uncertainty is important in my work that I don't know what it's going to look like in the in the end. So does that early stage of your process then inform the progression of the work? It seems to yeah. me that it's so organic and that one, whether it's meditation, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, creating natural dyes or gathering your own pigments, but there's a, s a sequence in some ways mm -hmm. that one aspect leads into the next aspect and then eventually materializes as I'm looking at your beautiful work here, mm -hmm. this, the series or the scrolls, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, it, does, that, does that track? It's less premeditated and more yeah. process oriented. Definitely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Like materials lead the work okay. and the ideas come out of the materials. I'd love to hear a little bit more about the scrolls. Yeah. You know, the, the form of your pieces that I've been admiring your work for a long time and the form for me is the think the thing that I was drawn into first mm -hmm. before getting to really see the texture up close. You know, I feel like I want to get as close as possible to the scrolls in particular and walk yeah. through them and yeah. feel them in proximity. And a lot of the work is this is relatively speaking the same size as you know, a human body too. Mm -hmm. And so that relationship between that relational quality of the work yeah. from an, an abstraction perspective, right? It's not a figurative piece, although you were mentioning some fig figurative elements coming forward. Yeah. There's something about being a human being and a human body in proximity to a piece of artwork that is almost mirroring that back to us. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great observation. I feel like that whole, like importance of the body to body relationship mm -hmm. um, to the work came out of my early years in mural painting, okay. working large scale and like having to use the whole body to create the work. Sure. And so that physicality remains important in my work. And a lot of these pieces, like I had mentioned, putting paper underneath my bed, like, and um, I've done a series of like, where I did put paper underneath my yoga mat during yoga um, workshops or classes and doing yoga on top of paper. So the body has some sort of impact on the surface mm -hmm. to create a lot of the textures that are happening or um, taking full sheets of paper and dyeing them and pulling them out and drying them. So that whole like interaction with the body and the paper becomes really important in the physicality. Um, and then also the scale of it sure. so that the, the viewers having this experience of their body to the size of the piece. Um, and certainly the scrolls, I think, br bring that challenge. So although they're not irregular shapes, like the cutout pieces I, um, I make, they have this long verticality that's like mimics the, our own verticality, but they're bigger than ourselves as well because they go from ceiling to floor usually, depending on where they're located. And I'm also thinking about these scrolls much more in an installation kind of view so that they would be um, something that you can walk around or, or through um, and have a, a very different experience of something that's hanging on a wall. When you're working on a scroll, mm -hmm. are you, are you internally refer like internally referencing a message or a statement? You know, oftentimes when we see vertical work, it has a sort of mm -hmm. statement making quality to it. Mm -hmm. Or do you feel like that's a little bit less um, important in the yeah. process? I think when the first scrolls I made were 2018 and I shared four of those at the Harwood Art Center here in Albuquerque, mm -hmm. and they did have more of a specific purpose or meaning, I was actually, so the scroll first coming out of looking at Asian art mm -hmm. and also my own practice, like with chanting and looking at a scroll and having that reciprocal kind of mm -hmm. feedback um, is where the format of the scroll idea. So going back to spirituality and then the four scrolls that were first made were really made um, out of the domestic, about the domestic realm. So they were made with like um, stovetop burner piece, for example, where I burned marks from the stovetop and then repeated the shape um, throughout the scroll. And one was the other one was the one that got put through the washing machine. So I was really referencing again, trying to make that non-dualism between spirituality, um, thus held by the scroll, and motherhood held and represented kind of through the marks um, that appeared on the surface. 
and the way that it was made. There are sort of recognizable forms in these two scrolls yeah. that we're looking at. And is that connected to your own personal symbology, mm -hmm. each piece? Yeah, it's a great question because um, that's sort of newer for me. So I took the catenary curve that I've been working on since also the beginning of the pandemic um, to now and seeing how far I can stretch it. And to my surprise, it's come back to symbolism. And again, I think that really has to do with this diagnosis and facing my own mortality that it's like, am I really going to question why I'm making this? And it's like, no, I have it. It's relating back to my immediate experience and things that I'm wanting to process and share with the world. So, um, for example, the the teardrop raindrop blue piece was the first in the series. And that was actually before it was actually before my diagnosis. I broke my ankle. It hasn't been a great year, um, but I started with the teardrops thinking about that suffering and also kind of coming out of the end of the pandemic and just like you know, we're not the end of it, but like when people started to go back out in the world and just thinking about like that collective grieving as well as like my own grief that I was beginning to process. And um, so that really has had very specific individual symbolic meaning, but also um, hopefully open enough to invite others in to have their own experience. Yeah. Um, the second piece was the breast piece, I call it. I mean, it's called mother, but um, it was created just before my diagnosis, but it's made out of repetition of different breast shapes, sizes, and colors. Um, and so there again, it's just the power of seeing intuition of art making. And um, and then I have another piece with made out of cloud formations. And so all of these are becoming part, as I now realize I'm working of um, something I'm studying in Eastern philosophy called the bardos, which is the spaces in between things, also known as the gap. You could think about like in art, ne negative space versus positive space. So it's like resting in the spaces in between um, in order to find freedom okay. and relief and ease and peace and joy. Maybe it would be nice to go into one piece and look at the piece itself mm -hmm. and Walk us through your process. Walk us through your relationship. It's all about relationship. So walk yeah. us through your relationship to sure. your own practice and process. OK. Yeah. Um, so the piece that I would like to talk about is uh, the blue piece. It's called, um, it's Buddha, actually. So the, the piece okay. belongs to a series of five, and there's only four hanging right now here, but they're called sacred families. But in Buddhism, they're actually called the um, the Buddha families. And so like they're, they each have their own, they describe their own energy. So um, both sides, there's always two sides of a coin in Buddhism, two different kinds of energies. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the blue Buddha, you have uh, the Buddha being grounded, something that's very centered and central and at the core base at ease and peace. Mm -hmm. And then you have the other side, which is the groundlessness, like the space where we're not rooted and grounded, but like the space where, you know, it's sort of the, the negative emotion of, I guess, the antithesis of being grounded. So whatever those energies might imply to somebody. So thus the two parts that are seemingly coming together but or, or maybe separate um so to me the wall and the, the empty space becomes just as much a part of the piece as the piece itself um, and it's a necessary place to pause um it also creates i think a tension of like is it coming together or is it coming apart so it's kind of trying to explore its own like the parts and their interconnections to one another so that's sort of the meaning behind that piece. The way that I make it, so all of the all of these pieces are made out of mulberry paper, and it took me many iterations of this piece to arrive at its final form. So I start with, um, I actually dip a string into ink to create the catenary curve shape. Yeah. Okay. So that's how I get the curves, and I play with the curves on large paper, and I cut them out, and then I juxtapose different relationships of the form until I arrive at the one um, that speaks to me the most. Um, and once the form is defo defined, I use the mulberry paper 
And on this one, um, I mounted mica flake. So some of it was sourced um, from North Carolina from a friend who actually has since has also passed from a, a rare form of cancer. Um, it was a gift that we she sent to me because we had been hiking out there and I noticed the sparkling color and shimmer and um, and then I, I had to source the rest of it from somewhere else. Um, but it's basically mounted with, I use rice paste, so it's a natural glue. Um, and I use the paste to glue the mica down onto the natural mulberry paper. And then um, it took me a while to figure out where I wanted to go with it, but I ended up taking some ultramarine blue. And I should t talk about that the colors in each of these pieces are significant, they're symbolic to the different families. And so like the Buddha is indicated as blue. Um, and so I used ultramarine um, blue pigment, a dry pigment, and basically like buffed it on top and then um, kind of made sure it like pressed into the creases between the mica flake. Mm -hmm. um, and that is pretty much it for that piece. Um, seemingly simple, but it takes many iterations and the right materials to have it kind of come together. Thank you so much for sharing more and allowing us to gather with you in your yeah. space today. Yeah, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure. Pleasure's all mine. Okay, we're back. Thank you so much, Daniela. It's wonderful to watch that again. Um, thank you for sharing so transparently and vulnerably with all of us. Um, I want to open this up now. This portion is our sort of our Q and A portion. Um, want to remind everybody that we captured thirty minutes of a longer conversation. Carrie and I and Mark spent a, a long time with you in your studio. And so, the, of course, there were so many amazing topics that we got into. It's really hard to put it all into a 30 minute window. So there inevitably are things we didn't get uh, deep enough into. So, um, you know, if things have sparked your curiosity, folks in the audience that you would like to come back to or Danila, something that you want to comment on, please, let's do that for sure. I have a couple of notes from our conversation. I want to remind folks that you can pin um, Danila to the, uh, if you go to those little three dots in the top right hand uh, corner of the, um, the rectangle, you can then set your view to speaker. And so then you can have um, less of it, the gallery view, you can really have, uh, you know, your, your uh, featured speaker. So I encourage folks to do that if that feels good for you. Um, so let's open it up. And it, I'll again, let everyone know um, that you are able to, you know, use the, the Zoom feature to raise your hand or simply speak out or put something in the chat and we will do our best uh, on the tax side to see where folks are asking questions. So we'll open it up now um, for Q and A. Yeah, um, I see Tom, I see your hand. Thank you, go ahead. Did anyone else raise their hand? I don't, I don't need to go first. <laughs> Big question, though, uh, Dylan. By the way, your work is beautiful. I enjoyed that little video and hearing about what you're doing. And um, it's beautiful. Uh, on the Buddha piece, um, well, first of all, before that, what drew you to the catenary curve? Because that, to me, seems like an overarching, well, that's almost a pun, but it's a, um, you know, it's a primary um, Thing in your work. So what, what brought you to it? Is it something you've always been aware of or did you see it one day and say, I, I need to investigate that? Hi, Tom, thanks for your question. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Um, yeah, actually, so it was, it came to me at the beginning of the pandemic. I'd mentioned the sacred family pieces, the cutouts on the wall here, um, which really were the first deep, exploration into them. It started in drawing, as I mentioned in the video. And um, it really, I was like, after, with the two kids still at home at the beginning of the pandemic, I got really worried, like, oh no, I'm not gonna have any time to make work. And so I started to uh, get up at like 4.30 in the morning to work in my studio for a couple hours before they're awake. And I thought, what could I do in a short period of time? And it, 
it was drawing, I realized, and it was something that drawing, I hadn't really drawn, like literally used the form as much um, over the past five, six years, um, where I was, where the kids were younger and I was much more invested in material and like kind of quicker processes um, that allowed me to make the work. And so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll start drawing again. It's been a long time. And so I just got a sketchbook out and I, you know, in the past I used to draw, I would start from life. I would work from observation of trees, but this time I thought I would like to try drawing from a non-objective standpoint and just see what would evolve. And so I did sort of a hundred day project um, and I gave myself a couple constraints and one of them was the catenary curve. And I just wanted to see what variations I could get out of it and why I picked the catenary curve I don't know. I think it's more just an aesthetic. It's a beauty that I've always found. Um, whether it wasn't really super conscious why I found beauty in this very simple form, but um, as I started to look around me, you know, you know, you notice it everywhere in nature. Um, you can find it in architecture. Gaudi used it a lot. Um, and you know, or just the the elegance of a laundry line. Um, there's something about that shape that has always been just compelling to me. So I suppose it was more of an aesthetic choice and just a simple construct that I could follow to investigate. Thanks so Great. much, John. Thanks, Danila. Yeah. Are there questions that folks might have? Uh, yeah, Carrie, go ahead. I'm unmuted. Okay. Hi, Danella. So good Hi. to see you. Thank you so much again for having us. It was just pure pleasure. Yeah. I, I have a question that might you might not really want to talk about it. So you just tell me to go away. <laughs> I'm wondering with your with your diagnosis and and first of all, there's been changes, I guess, that occur in our mental states when we have something like that to deal with. Do you feel any sense of pressure within yourself? To, to complete things, to have a message that you want us to want the world or the art viewers to see, to feel, to interact with, that maybe you feel it, you might not have the chance. And so you feel sort of pressure to, to do it, to get it out there. Thanks for your question, Carrie. That's, uh, um, I think I could think about that for a long time. Um, but at the moment, my immediate response is no, I don't feel the pressure to communicate anything, any specific meaning or purpose. Um, although I do feel inclined to engage with my experience and um, kind of tapping into what's happening internally. Um, and help me process it visually. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I know that there's an answer, Danoa. I just yeah. kind of, I think that we all sort of, when we have a show coming, we feel like, oh, I have to hurry up and get this done. Do I, yeah. do I skip the last painting that I was gonna do because I've said what I want to say? Yeah, and no. I don't feel that urgency. I don't feel that kind of anxiety or pressure. Like, I don't think it's an obligation I have um, to anyone, um, but I do feel like it has more to do with my, sort of the legacy I might leave behind. Like, what is it that I want to share with the world? And that's, so that's what we would like to see. Thanks. I'm sorry. I said, that's what we're, if, if that's all right, I'll leave it right there where we are. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, sure. Carrie. Thanks, Danila. Yeah. And again, thank you for being so transparent and vulnerable with all of us today. Um, a question that we had talked about that you had asked me about um, that I want to come back to you was about really when you started talking about chance and intention early yeah. on in our conversation and play. And we started to talk about it, that idea yeah. of spontaneity, and, and one, we both wanted to come back to it, so I want to honor your request to come back to it. Um, could you share with us a little bit about your relationship to play? Yeah, thanks, and it's fun. It's good to, like, it's like the other side of the coin, right, like the difficult in terms of, like, 
and thinking about mortality and end of life and the heavy, the weight of that versus like the playfulness that is present when we are still alive or living. And for me, like play has very much been reintroduced um, through my children, of course. I think, you know, having been a practicing artist for 20 years, and especially I feel like coming out of MFA programs, there's often this like seriousness around art and an art practice. And um, I don't know, like for me, play was like a rediscovery into the joy of process. And that real, that play manifested through materials again, like, experimenting with um, like, what if I slept on paper or what would happen if, um, you know, I collected eggshells for a hundred days and crushed them and, and um, walked on them or like just, or like one was like my kids when they were younger, um, I did a piece out of clay and my daughter, it was out in the sun drying and my daughter took the hose and started to wet it again and walk on it. And so like, just finding these, like, kind of, like I said, chance, um, happenings almost on top of the materials and allowing them to be part of the process and and playing with you know where I could take it I think yeah thanks for going a little bit back into it all yeah. I can think is that's an that's a heck of a lot of eggshells to be, <laughs> to be living and walking with and that just sounds like a, a joy also to be able to experience art with your kids yeah yeah it was fun um are there any other questions? I think I see a hand. Karen. Hey, Danielle. Hey, Karen. I, I really enjoyed the talk and I'm really glad I stopped in. And um, just, I have like five questions, but I can't just like, yeah, I keep thinking I'm going to ask one and then I change. Just to talk about motherhood a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I just thought about how I was so happy that I finally decided to have my daughter when I did. I had her very late in my career too. And, you know, and so like I had, you know, been very focused and serious on my own thing, you know, and so serious that, you know, like in some ways there was no play anymore. Mm -hmm. And, um, and having her not only introduce, you know, the aspect of watching your child play and starting to, maybe mimic some of that lightheartedness, but um, also, um, you know, not t taking yourself so seriously and just realizing there's other things in life and, and, you know, and letting those other things kind of morph into your career. And so I think you've done a, just a really beautiful job at that. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that's actually a question but um, I wanted to say that. And then I wanted to say, I, I wanted to ask you about your meditation a little more. Um, I, um, you know, I meditate when I come into my studio because like it's a practice that I do just for the art making. And it sounds like yours maybe isn't, or I, I just like to know if you always force yourself to do that 20 minutes before you start working. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, no, I don't, I'm not, I try not to be rigid with my meditation either. I think I've ebbed and flowed with it. It's been a more recent, um, reintroduction of that before my studio to like, like I would say in the last year, um, in the last six months, like really making that commitment to sit down, um, just to clear the mind. So, um, it has ebbed, it has ebbed and flowed. I find it like almost, especially through the pandemic time mm -hmm. or in any life challenges, um, like one of the things I have to do before I work, because otherwise I can let all that anxiety and stress destroy the peace. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's why I re really, really recommitted myself to it um, was was to put that down before I entered into the work, um, all the anxiety, worry, whatever kind of energy I had from dropping the kids off at school and being able to like start kind of with a clean slate and, you know, to empty the mind and then allow, allow it's kind of that space between, right? Allowing the gap um, to, to enter the gap. And that is what 
fuels my creativity when I can be in that space. Um, that was one of my other really things I enjoyed about the talk is the space between, because I'm always thinking about that as well. And, and not just the space between that I leave a gap in the artwork or the, but it's like in your thought process, the space between words, the space between people, the space between ideas, your thoughts, that blank area, when you stop a thought and you just kind of rest mm -hmm. that that weird area that's impossible to put into words that's like the thing I really like working with and I see it in your work like I connect to it mm -hmm. um I really incredibly love these pieces behind you on the wall mm -hmm. and that will bring me to my last question and I'll stop monopolizing but um I wanted to um no, physically, if I were in the room with you and I could see those up close, how did you make the form other than the paper? I mean, how did you make the framework to put that paper on? Yeah, um, so they're mounted on wood, um, which is how they're hanging and they're hanging on French cleats. So there's a cleat on the wall behind them so that they're kind of coming off of the wall a little bit. Oh, so they're floating. They're floating. Yeah. And so you mean it's one big board, one big flat board cut? Or, um, or I'm are they framed? They're no, they're not framed. They're they're one board or two. In the case of the piece it's, you know, where there's two parts coming together, they're obviously individual boards, but yeah, it's one board. That's so cool. I you know, I use French cleats in my work, but mm -hmm. I use them to pull them tight mm. you know oh, because so many people's walls are irregular yeah and so like I can get the piece to pull to the wall a little tighter uh -huh. but I've just been starting to experiment with like floating okay so it's interesting that those are actually floating yeah that's interesting and Karen I just thank you so much for all your questions and being here I really admire your work as well and um, the only thing I would say about the wood is that it's really heavy. Um, so I'm not sure this is like the final solution for these kinds of works, especially as I consider if they need to get shipped or stored, you know, like there's, it, there's issues around the weight of it. Um, but I also need to consider, um, you know, the sustainability of it. Like I don't, like I've thought about, mount, like I know you work a lot in metal. Um, I've thought about thin sheets of metal, but I don't know. I just, I, and, or like even a foam board, but that bends and warps. And so I've, I've sort of thought about other materials, but um, to, in order to make them lighter, but I haven't quite, I'm not sure I've quite landed on the right ones yet. Well, well, I'm surprised you're not having trouble with the warping of the solid board. Well, that's, that's the other issue too, especially here in the desert with the fluctuating temperature. Um, I'm not having trouble with these. I think they're, not they're t t the scale that they're at um it's been okay so far um but yeah it's something to think about and consider for sure thank we'll have to get so together much. sometime and talk materials <laughs> i would love it karen i'd love it thank you you two okay. have a lot to talk about thank you so much karen for your thoughtful questions um i think i saw a hand um a hand raised claire um did you have your hand raised virtual hand raised i did yeah okay great <laughs> Um, hi, Daniela and everybody. I really, really loved the video and um, beautiful interviewing as well, Lauren. Um, I, a tiny little thing. I wonder if floated panels could be a solution for the wood so that you're still using wood, but it's a lot lighter than a solid piece of, you know, that wasn't my question, but that just popped into my mind. A lot harder to make, but yeah, you know. Um, so my... I wanted to make an observation and then ask a question. I love the intersectionality and the integration. I've learned um, so much from you in those mm -hmm. arenas with your with your work. I think that's just, it's really a powerful um, philosophical standpoint that you come from. And then also it manifests really wonderfully in a material way too. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm interested um, for, as someone who also has kind of a, a Buddhist background. I'm curious in, have you brought your work kind of into your Buddhist 
uh, community. I'm wondering, cause there's an interesting thing about like, you know, how, how like Buddhist spirituality is maturing in, in the Western world. I'm wondering how, like if you've shared any of your work with your, you know, with your group or your Sangha or something, and yeah. if, if there has been any almost dialogue in that context around your work, taking that question about spirituality and art in another direction. Yeah, thanks for your question, Claire. Thanks for being here too. Um, so yes, yes and no, like both and I guess. Um, I have one, I have a friend in my, in my spiritual community meditation. He's actually a local artist here as well, David D'Agostino, and he's more in the Zen tradition, but um, we, we are in a kind of collective Sangha that's been meeting online. And um, he's also an artist working here and him and I have done extensive um, over the years, last three years, conversations around that kind of intersection of art and Buddhism and, um, or the Dharma. And so him and I have talked a lot about that. We've experienced, we've, we've collaborated together on especially shifting towards this commitment towards um, natural materials and kind of these ideas of non-aggression um, in the work, also simplicity of form and kind of that wavering back between form and formlessness. So him and I have done quite a bit of um, conversation and dialogue around it. Um, and actually pretty soon here, I'm supposed to lead a talk in the group on, on art and Buddhism. And um, I was thinking a little bit about it today and just trying to keep it more open in the sense that like not everybody in the group are gonna be artists. There, there happens to be, there were three of us. Now there's, two, actually, I think there's a few of us who are artists, but kind of thinking of it more broadly in terms of like, um, how does art show up? Like how can art show up in different ways other than just visual arts? Like the art of um, kind of, let's say commitment to eating plant, like a, a plant-based um, diet or how do we like the art of keeping a tidy home, um, the art of walking, you know, silent meditation or, so I think just kind of looking at it in a broader terms in terms of what we consider to be art, so. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Are there other questions that folks have in the mix? I have a couple as well. Um, yeah, Carrie, go ahead. I wanted to go back to your uh, your your materials that you use because we have some of the video there with you standing over your pot yeah. and pulling the, the paper out. Um, I'm assuming that the longer you leave the paper in the dye, the darker it get. Is that is that a correct assumption? Um, often, yeah. I'll I'll often leave it overnight um, to see if I can get like the most saturated color. And when you, do you ever do anything to the paper ahead of time? Like, like, um, can't think of anything particularly really, really natural how you would do it, but my, yeah. I suppose to use tape and then take a picture. My son used to use tape and on a picture and then take a picture of it and then go back in and use his graphic design skills to, mm. to design, well, for me, kind of really strange looking things at that particular stage of his life. But it was, it was the shape of tape. And it yeah. would show, even though it no longer looked like it on, on the finished product. So I wondered, do you, do you yeah. have anything like that that you do to the paper that you, so that this Yeah, stand, this yeah, run? I do. Like this orange piece behind me, I don't know if I can get any closer to it, but um, like, for example, that one, I poured the dye on top of it after a bunch of things had happened to the paper. In that particular piece, it had been, had like thorns pushed through it that I pulled out. And then um, the dye absorbed into the holes and crevices of where those thorns used to be. Or um, I had a, I have had some pieces that I mentioned, I used the washing machine. So I would run the paper through the washing machine first. And it, it kind of did what I was expecting. The dye that I poured on top, it absorbed into the creases where it had folded and it kind of made it look like it was a drawn line. So um, yeah, I do do stuff to the paper sometimes before I dye it. That's exciting. That's exciting. Yeah, so it's, it's fun. When you take when you take it out of the water and then you laid it over your drying rack, is is it going to get lighter, as most things do? Yeah, it, yeah. It's almost like if you think about like acrylic paint. Um, it dry. Well, does acrylic acrylic? I forget now. It's been so long, but I think it dries darker, right? Or is it lighter? 
Anyway, it dries. It often dries lighter. Uh-huh. And then is that part of the, the unpredictability of your work that you don't really know the, what, what, yeah. what you're going to end up with and what lines will show up? Yeah. And also like the consistency of it is not necessarily going to be a solid dye. Like there'll be, sometimes there can be some patchiness to it. Um, some staining. Um, in fact, I have one, like I try and reserve, I have three different dye pots, but one of them I I have mixed iron in and iron you have to keep separate from everything else because it, it darkens the color. It called, it's called saddening. And so, um, I think I had used iron, somehow iron got mixed into one of my other pots and then I was getting like little dark spot spots on it. So like these kind of imperfections that happen through the dyeing process and just not being fastidious, I guess, with my pots. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> well, what's your reaction when that happens? I mean, did you just I, throw the out or was that usable someplace else? Oh yeah. Yeah. I just, I mean, I have like racks full of paper that I've dyed and, um, and that's sort of like creating my own collage material. And then I use it when I see, a, you know, when it presents itself to a certain piece. So I invite any of that is not a problem at all. Thanks, that's cool. Yeah. Thanks, Carrie. Um, uh, I think Aaliyah had your, you had your hand up and I'll just ask folks if you, um, if I don't call your name, it's because I don't see the little Zoom icon hand please just pop in the chat that you have a question. We'll probably have time for maybe one or two more questions um, before we wrap up. Um, can you guys hear me actually? Yes. Yeah. Okay, couldn't tell if it was still on mute or not. Um, you talked about switching back and forth from form and formlessness. And I was wondering, when did you decide to go into abstraction in general? And do you always go back and forth from these ideas of, figure and abstraction. It's something I also kind of go back and forth with. So I'm curious, how did you come to abstraction in the first place? And was it during the pandemic or was it earlier when you did the oil paintings and the murals? Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, I feel like there's a couple of questions in there, but um, yeah. the form and formless. Um, no, I'm gonna start with the other one, the abstraction. So um, I, in undergrad, I used a lot of different forms and I was, I had mentioned in the talk briefly that I did some mural paintings. So there were some figures that I used and um, definitely representational imagery. It was in graduate school where I really emptied out the narrative and um, also the imagery, the, rep the representational imagery that I was using and really started to explore abstraction as a more open possibility um, for both, um, process and also for internal meaning. Um, and so it was, that was 2000, it's been a while now, but in 2001 is when I got my master's. And so that's really when I started to embrace abstraction. And at the time it was based off of, I would start, I mentioned I drew from nature. So I, I really looked at the landscape. I was living in Seattle at the time and would draw from trees and then would abstract from from the work. I would take the work that I did outside back in the studio and then abstract it. Um, so that was really what I did for 15 years. And um, I had a show at the time in Seattle called Form and Formlessness. And I've always been interested in that idea of like, um, and that kind of goes back to some Buddhist ideas of form being something like more solid, like an idea, like concrete in our minds, like also visually, like things hold inherent meaning. But then the formlessness is kind of more the spaciousness of the mind and um, allowing that space in between again to, um, or the dissolving of the form to allow some other experience or meaning to come from it. And so um, that, that all dates back to like 20 years ago. Um, but yeah, so I've been working in abstraction for a while and I just find that it, it's a vehicle for allowing a greater kind of exploration and, and meaning, I think. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Just looking at your work, it, it's just interesting hearing you talk about it because it has sort of a an atmospheric quality, but then within that shape or the curve, it sort of gives it a form at the same time. So it has this sort of expansive feeling, but also a contained feeling within the shape. And I like that play on those two feelings. Thanks. Yeah. Thank yeah. Thanks so much. 
I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions here, and then we will close. Um, is there a question in the? Oh, I think Mark has a question. <laughs> Mark, go ahead. Mark. Hey, Daniela. Um, uh, you were talking about your community, your Tumblr community um, back in the day. And oh, blogging, blogging. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we went yeah. way back. <laughs> um, I was on WordPress, but yeah. <laughs> my mistake. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, but then it got me thinking about all the all the artists that I did get to speak to at the at the at the show in September, um, but I didn't speak to you at that time, mm -hmm. and so you know I got to ask just so many people about um, about the, about community, about um, mm -hmm. you know all all of these abstract artists kind of um, coming out of the woodwork, and and it seemed like um, a lot of the res responses I got were um, you know yeah we've been sort of waiting for or hoping for kind of this opportunity to come together. Um, so I just wanted to get like a little bit of your, your, your read on that and your, um, your feeling about this community or um, the, 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 the value of community, you know, in your, in your day-to-day -day work and your practice. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I think community is always great for artists because it's such an isolated practice. Um, we spend a lot of time alone in our studios. Um, I think especially in early motherhood, I felt that extra kind of isolation. And then having also mentioned, you know, being new to an area can add these like layers of like isolation. And I mean, although I've been here now seven years and I, I feel, um, well integrated into the community, um, I've found that in smaller communities, sometimes it is harder to, um, how do I say this, like really connect like in a larger group because we're either like in disparate places or I don't know, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I have found it easier to be in community. I had like in larger cities, like in Seattle and San Francisco where I live, surprising you would think it would be harder, but I found in smaller communities, it's harder to find your community. Um, but I, so I think that the, like, the, for example, TAC, like this is a great collective and way to bring artists together and like find that shared interest in whether it's abstraction or art making and to support one another. I guess what I was hesitant to say is that in smaller communities, sometimes I feel like there's a competitive, competitiveness for resources and you lack a supporting community. Um, and I think that's what's so wonderful about this group is that there's so much support being given to artists and opportunities for artists to get to what, know one another and to learn from one another. And um, I think there couldn't be a better time for it. Sorry, that was um, not the most clear direct answer, but I think I got it out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. Um, and yeah. thanks. Thank you so much, Danila. I, I, um, I want to be mindful of, of our time. We said we'd be about an hour, hour and 10. We're a little bit, you know, a little bit past uh, an hour. And so thank you for sharing. Again, thank you for sharing your thoughts on community, really echo, mirroring and echoing to us um, what our hope with TAC is, is truly to create a platform for artists to connect with each other. We encourage folks to bring their ideas, other ideas to the table um, and to share. And it's just been a wonderful opportunity for all of us to get to know each other better across Northern New Mexico. So just on behalf of TAC, I wanna say thank you again for opening your studio to us and your world and your artist practice and your life and everything you're going through right now. Um, I wish that everyone could get so close and see, you know, see your work so close. We did our best to get the texture to really capture it. Um, but I want to encourage everybody to please check out Danila's website online. Um, I'm going to actually put it in the chat right now so everyone can, can grab this. Um, and it's your name, danilamald.com website and then on Instagram. And I think there we go. Um, and then we will be having future TAC Talks as well. 
Our next one will actually be early January, and it will be a conversation between Carrie Bell and Karen Tyson. And um, we're going to push it, nudge it a little bit with the holidays. So just after uh, the holidays. So stay tuned for that. We're really looking forward to that, followed by talks with Susan Pascarelli and Bob Horline and lots of folks um, through the coming year. We're actually excited to share that we have lots of things booked through 2024. So it's amazing. Um, so really amazing. So thank you, Danila. Um, thank you for your generosity of spirit. And thank you everyone for being here with us today. And um, we'll say bye for now. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you thank so you much, both. everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.